Good afternoon. I'm Claire Brindis, and I'm the director of the Philip R. Lee Institute for Health Policy Studies. And I want to welcome all of you to our 2019 Chancellor's Health Policy Lecture. This is a tradition at UCSF that was started under Chancellor Mike Bishop with the nudging and leadership support of Steve Schroeder, whose idea it was to bring the best health policy speakers and opinion leaders and researchers to our campus to reflect upon all the wonderful health services work that goes on in our campus. The reality is that our campus has tremendous expertise in bench research, in clinical research, and also health services outcomes and policy. And it was Steve's vision and supported by Mike Bishop and then since then other chancellors to really recognize that our missions here in terms of research and clinical care and service are very much shaped by the health policy arena in which we do our work. And it's very much, it's very important for all of us to be translators of that research that we conduct so that our various audiences who use our information can begin to understand the role of evidence in shaping public policy, in shaping public opinion, and helping to understand the impact of health policy on our patients, our employees, and the general community. I'm really honored that uh, Chancellor Sam Hawgood has been a champion of these lectures and has continued the tradition. And while Sam began his career at UCSF in 1982 as a basic scientist doing really groundbreaking research that has contributed to the health and well-being of millions of babies across the world, that his growth as uh, the chair of pediatrics, then the dean in our school, and now chancellor, he's our 10th chancellor, uh, and he has really seen the vision of the relationships between our missions around improving clinical care, including groundbreaking research and bench research, and then our mission around equity and elimination of social disparities. So while these are components that sometimes people think of as being very separate, Sam's vision is understanding how all of these are interrelated and how this dance interacts with the policy environment in which we all do our work and the complexity of the world in which we function. So I'm very, very delighted to have Sam come up and he will be introducing to you our speaker today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Claire. It's a great pleasure for me to be here today as we continue to bring uh, truly outstanding uh, speakers in the health policy arena to UCSF to uh, provide us with different perspectives on current health policy issues and highlight the really important role that, as Claire said, health policy plays in the lives of our faculty, fellows, residents, and students. Um, it seems redundant for me to say, but I'll say it anyway, that we are in uh, very politically challenged uh, times. Uh, it's a difficult climate, uh, but I'm op op very optimistic knowing that the contributions of my colleagues here at UCSF as they continue to dedicate themselves to improve health and health care on a local, uh, state, national, and international level. Uh, they work tirelessly to break down the roadblocks uh, that restrict the services to those most in need. Indeed, it's the very work being done here at UCSF, as well as the work of leaders across the country, such as our speaker today, that will bring us through to the next solutions in healthcare. So now it's my great pleasure to uh, welcome and introduce our speaker today, Dr. Drew Altman. Uh, Drew is a leading expert on national health policy. In the early 1990s, he founded uh, the current day Kaiser Family Foundation, an organization that is focused on major healthcare issues facing the nation and the role that the US plays in global health policy. Uh, before founding the Kaiser Family Foundation, Drew had a truly remarkable uh, career in public service. He is a former commissioner of the Department of Human Services for the state of New Jersey a former director of the Health and Human Services at the Pew Charitable Trusts, 
a former vice president of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, and he served in the Carter administration amongst other work. He earned his PhD in political science at MIT and completed his postdoctoral work at Harvard University before moving to that career in public service. He holds an honorary doctorate from the Morehouse School of uh, Medicine, and he was just telling me is now a neighbor here at Mission Bay, having moved the offices of the foundation from Silicon Valley to uh, down the street where he can watch Giants games and perhaps even an Oakland Raiders game, uh, we'll see. Um, Drew, you said in a recent uh, discussion that you had that the Kaiser Foundation was once described as nationally known, but locally anonymous. Uh, we share that to some extent. I'm sure most people in the room have had to explain to people that no, they're at UCSF, not USF. We're the ones with the hospitals. Uh, so we're very excited that you are now a neighbor and uh, Claire was just filling me in on some of the uh, initiatives that I think uh, uh, your co-location with us here at Mission Bay will enable in the future. So please uh, come to the podium and uh, let's welcome Drew. Can you all hear me? Yes, I think you can. Thank you, Claire. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, all of you, for coming. I particularly want to thank my friend, Senator Gernberger, who came an unnecessarily long distance to be here today. It's great to see you all. Um, I just have a, a personal policy. I have a ritualized, a ritual, uh, a response to these overly nice um, introductions. It's just a story I tell. Some of you have heard it, I think. But it's a story of a letter I got from my then 99-year-old grandmother the day I got that PhD in political science at MIT, and it was just a letter. And all it said was, Dear Drew, about that degree, so what are you going to do, open a political science store? <laughs> <laughs> Which is sort of what I've done. Um, it's not just an honor for me to be here. It's kind of a plan, which is now uh, coming together. We moved our headquarters from the Silicon Valley to China Basin. I think, yes, it was, it was last March. Uh, one of the benefits of that uh, part of the plan was to develop closer ties with the UCSF, and we are starting to do that today. We, have, um, we are developing a new fellowship program for um, a couple of medical nursing or pharmacy students each year. It will be UCSF Kaiser Fellows who will spend a year with us working on a health policy project. We promise not to corrupt them uh, to <laughs> terribly, and now I'm here today uh, delivering this talk, and we've only just begun, and I'm just psyched about developing this um, partnership with you. There was some terrible movie once, I can't remember the actor who said, he would always say, I love it when a plan comes together, but this is a plan which is now coming together, so I'm happy about that. I was asked to say a few things about myself, about uh, Kaiser, and then of course uh, deliver the Chancellor's lecture. I don't really want to say very much about myself, um, so just a couple of things. But for those of you who don't know me, I am an ex, uh, or some would say failed, um, academic, a political scientist from MIT who made my career in federal and state government and a couple of big East Coast uh, foundations before coming to California to start uh, the current um, KFF, when the previous Henry J. Kaiser Family Foundation was struggling and was effectively um, dissolved. It was that first government job in the Carter administration that really changed my life. It made it about public service, and that's what I feel I've been doing, whether I've been in government um, or in nonprofits. When I founded KFF, way back when now, I thought I'd stay for five years because that's sort of what I'd always done. And um, what you do, and I had no idea that it would become such a wonderful and big part of my life's work. Uh, I almost took a couple of uh, big federal jobs. Um, I look back with special fondness at that job that you mentioned, um, which was called then in New Jersey Commissioner of Human Services um, in the state of New Jersey. Uh, now we have a new governor in California with an exciting uh, agenda, and so I'll just mention that I am actually a big fan of state government when the circumstances are right. Uh, my philosophy is that the same government job can be the greatest thing you ever do or the worst thing you ever do, depending on the circumstances. Um, and so, um, and, and I love that job in New Jersey. I'm not from New Jersey, but I love that job in New Jersey. So I thought I'd tell you, even though I know a couple of you have heard it, but it's my, just my favorite story. 
Uh, just very quickly, my story about my first day on the job as Commissioner of Human Services in the state of New Jersey. The problem I had was I couldn't find the job. And I was very young and I walked around. I was in Trenton, of course. I'd never been there. There's no reason to go to Trenton if you don't ever go to Trenton. So I couldn't find the building. And finally, I found some guard and he said, he literally said, kid, it's that building there. And I said, but there's no sign in front of the building. He said, yeah, but it's there. Just go up to the top floor. I had to talk my way in. And I'm like the new commissioner. Sure. And I went up to the top floor and met everyone, did the appropriate things, and then I said something like, you know, um, we are, we were the largest organization in the state of New Jersey. We have 28,000 employees, and I can't remember how many billions of dollars. And I know we're very proud of what we do. There shall be a sign in the front of this building. I realized this was how I would take control as I can't remember how old I was. I was very sensitive about that, of this giant um, organization. Well, nine months later, after the job was stopped first because the wrong procurement rules were used, and then it was stopped the second time because the wrong union team worked on the job and had to start over, fine. Then it was stopped a third time by a wonderful letter from the State Department of Treasury, and this could only happen in government, which literally said, this job should not be done because it is too small to do. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was my birthday, and uh, my chief of staff came in and said, you need to come downstairs. Now there were newspaper stories, will Commissioner Altman get his sign? <laughs> and the entire press corps was there, maybe 800 people were there. The front of the building was draped with huge sheets, and they peeled back the sheets, and there it was, the New Jersey Department of Hunan Services. <laughs> they spelled it wrong. became my, my cynical metaphor for a lot of things, you know, that in, in government what you work on is just so truly important, but it's hard to get stuff done. And in the private sector, it isn't quite as important, but you can get stuff done really fast. Um, it's my Russian perspective on things, I have Russian roots. Uh, no, I was truly proud of what we were able to do there, the most progressive and leading form of welfare reform at the time, and a big school-based youth services program that I really believed in, and health services housing programs for the homeless, and the first Medicaid managed care model. We actually created something with a stupid name, the Garden State Health Plan, and created a state-run, turned our whole Medicaid program into a state-run, federally qualified HMO. Uh, which was an interesting concept. Uh, and then it kind of withered and disappeared because, of course, we went out of office. And you know how it goes. Okay, um, that's me. Let me tell you a little bit uh, about us. Um, the new KFF, we increasingly call ourselves, kind of like NPR did, KFF, was established in 1991. I won't go into details, but there was there were real problems and extreme dissatisfaction with the prior um, organization. And the late, great Congresswoman Barbara Jordan, who was a member of the board, gave a fabulous speech in her impeach Richard Nixon voice, exhorted everyone to dissolve the old organization and um, impeach the old organization and create a new one. Uh, and they appointed a wonderful guy with a glorious name, um, Hail Champion, as chair of the board uh, and decided to create a new organization. So to use a Soviet term and a Silicon Valley term at the same time, it was kind of a purge and a restart. Um, they found me, I had this idea uh, for a nonprofit organization that through information uh, could be an independent voice for people and a little bit, no delusions at all, but a little bit of a counterweight to the money in politics, which was coming to dominate uh, health care in the country. Uh, they liked that idea. Uh, I came out to California because I thought, uh, coming from Boston, if I did that, I might get tall and blonde. Um, and that plan worked. Um, and um, so off, off we went. We do that um, in three main ways. Uh, we produce lots of policy analysis and research, lots of polling and survey research, and while I won't go into it today, we actually run now the largest health newsroom in the country through a nonprofit model that we developed and launched in June of 2009, 
It's now the most rapidly growing part of our organization called Kaiser Health News. We do some other stuff, too, that we deeply care about. We run specialized and targeted HIV campaigns. We have a substantial global health policy program, but um, this is the core of what we do. We made a fundamental decision that we wanted to be California-based with a, a big DC presence. We did not want to be a Beltway uh, organization, and that has worked out for us. And while we are called the Kaiser Foundation, we're actually not a foundation, kind of important to understand that. The simplest way to think about us is just as an endowed nonprofit organization. Legally, we're something called a, a public charity, and today we're supported about 75% from our endowment and 25% from grants, which mostly come from foundations. So don't ask me for a grant because we get grants, we don't um, give grants. And lastly, in this little rundown um, of what we are and who we are that I was asked to, uh, asked to give, and importantly, given where we are, we have no connection to them. You know, those people on the other side of the bay, um, Kaiser Permanente, um, at all, except sometimes I get really angry letters from their enrollees. Like, you know, why in the world did you waste my precious premium dollars on that stupid study of the Medicaid program? Um, but we do honor the legacy of our mutual benefactor, Henry J. Kaiser, who once was an industrialist as famous in his day as Bill Gates is today. I know he's long forgotten. He did things like build the Liberty ships in World War II. Um, and actually, uh, a really cool car company that went head to head with GM and Ford and he had an amazing little sports car called the Kaiser Darren, which, extreme trivia, was Bill Clinton's first car. Um, so there, and I know the imagination runs wild and we won't go there. Um, I'm gonna mostly talk about public opinion today. So uh, before I get to the, to the data, I thought I'd spend a minute on, on why we poll. We thought, and this was right in the beginning, we did our very first survey or poll, uh, I think it was in 1992, so right when we got started. We felt there'd be a need for independent, objective uh, polling in health that didn't come from an advocacy group uh, or political pollsters or media organizations which do not specialize in health or poll about health policy issues. They might, you know, what do you think of the Trump plan or something, but that's uh, as far as it goes. Importantly for us, we were motivated by the idea of using public opinion research to give people a voice in the system, especially subgroups that don't normally have a voice in the system. We also stray a lot from healthcare in this polling. So we've done, for example, big surveys on um, college students and sexual violence on college campuses, the Puerto Rican people and how they're actually experiencing the um, recovery there our combat soldiers and their lives after their experiences in Afghanistan uh, and Iraq, the South African people some years ago and how they're feeling about the problems that have developed in their, in their new democracy, then their new democracy. We've had a big special interest I won't go into in, um, in South Africa. Um, we do not and have never felt that as a country, uh, we should just do what we find in our public opinion polls. Instead, we feel these polls point out where the challenges are uh, for all of us and for our leaders, or where there might be deficits in information or uh, public education challenges. Um, and something that's very important to me, in our surveys and polls, and you'll see this in just a minute, we always go beyond opinion and try and focus on what's actually happening to people in the healthcare system. What are their actual experiences? What's happening with, I'm gonna talk about this a lot, their medical bills, uh, what's happening with their health care? That's, and I always preach that experience trumps opinion, meaning we just focus on that a lot uh, and we um, care about that. Uh, and we poll ourselves, most of our polling we just do ourselves, but a, a lot of it we do with news organization partners together as a genuine joint venture. Our biggest partner is the Washington Post with whom we've done 34 big joint projects, but also the um, New York Times and National Public Radio. We have a really great survey coming out soon with the LA Times and The Economist increasingly where we look at experience 
uh, across countries recently um, at uh, attitudes towards late life issues uh, or loneliness, which is increasingly a concern for many people. Um, and we've been recognized for this, for example, by the Washington Post and by others. So, okay, that is the background. Let's hit rewind and go back to the midterms. I want to start with the midterms, and um, I may, may abbreviate this a little, but I'm going to talk about the midterms, and I'm going to talk about Medicare for All, because I kind of think you might be interested in that, and Medicaid, and then an issue that is especially on my mind, and, and, and I'll close. Um, let me start with, before I get to the opinion um, on this, just for health policy, what I think are the core implications uh, for health policy of the midterm elections. And, I, and I'm going to just, just start with this, the election of many more women and greater diversity. I, I don't know exactly what it means. I think it's hard to know exactly what it means. I think it means something. And I think it's going to mean a lot. Um, what could it mean? I think it almost certainly means a greater focus on health care issues, on reproductive health issues. This is all really good. Uh, and if you look at some of the new committee chairs uh, in the House, it's certainly uh, will mean that. So I wanted to start with that uh, because it's important and, and it is a change. Um, a second implication of the midterms, you know, we, we work a lot on what I would call the hardcore health policy issues. Uh, and so the big stuff that we have been working on that we worry about the most, as a result of the midterm elections, elections matter for policy, it will now not happen. So that's a big, big implication of the midterm elections. Repeal and replace now will not happen. A Medicaid cap or block grant now will not happen. Uh, the big issue that was always over the horizon, just kind of lurking with the Medicare program, be transformed into a voucher or premium support kind of program, now will not even be discussed. So elections really do matter. These things would now be blocked just by a Democratic House. It's just important to say that. It's quite important. We will absolutely see, you are seeing this start now, Democrats struggle for consensus. Uh, there will be an ongoing, um, through 2020 now, dance between the progressives in the party and you know the centrists and the moderates uh, in the party. Nancy Pelosi has many important roles now. One of them is as the umpire um, of this uh, debate. Uh, so when you see questions asked like what gets a hearing, what gets a vote, what gets a CBO score, what doesn't, it's all um, part of this. And uh, the presidential candidates are uncontrollable. They will scatter. and They will take all kinds of different positions on these kind of left center uh, issues that you will see unfold. Oversight, oversight, oversight. You will see it in health too, focusing on a set of issues that you see listed here. Um, it will be really important. Uh, does not have the power to stop the administration's efforts, but certainly could slow it down. Uh, so watch for that. And then something I think is really um, uh, did I? Oh, okay. I got ahead of myself. Um, in this environment, I don't think it's an environment where we'll see any major legislation pass. Um, it's hard for me to envision that, particularly as things become potentially more toxic with the Mueller report uh, and other developments. There are those who think there's a chance for some bipartisan efforts on drugs. Be interested later to see what Dave thinks about this, but I would personally bet against it. So in this um, environment, a lot of the action that will have an immediate impact will be in the states. And what's happening in the states is interesting and challenging to track and also to inform or, or influence because we've got the blue states and the red states in many ways moving in very, very different directions. Um, and California is, of course, a leader. And you probably know what's going on in California. We can come back to that. So our field is an annoying and frustrating field, health policy. And nothing's ever settled. And we thought it was, and we had a reasonably clear playing field that looked something like this. And then some judge in Texas came back from drilling for oil or hunting or whatever you do in Texas and um, decided to rule that the 
uh, ACA was unconstitutional. I will not take you through the tortured logic of that ruling, which is now uh, being appealed, but uh, you know, it means a few things politically. I think it is a campaign gift for the Democrats because it means they're on offense again. The ACA is threatened, and I'll say more about that. It may also bolster the agenda of the moderate Democrats as well. Um, in that, the agenda becomes more about preserving and protecting the ACA, but we will see. So now let me take you to some of the data. Um, we saw something in this election that we have not actually seen before. It may feel to you like we had seen it before, but we did not. And that is that um, health care became the top issue in an election. Um, it was, as you can see here, not the top issue for everyone. It was the top issue for Democrats and independents, but not for Republicans. Uh, as a result of this, Democrats have been on offense on health since repeal and replace. I think what happened is more of the public and especially Democrats got a sharper sense that they had a lot to lose in this debate about um, the ACA. Uh, so we saw that in our pre-election polls and then in the formal exit poll, you saw exactly the same thing. You see that 75-23 split between Republicans and Democrats. Something, you're shaking your head, I don't blame you. The partisan divide will be a theme, which I'll come back to in, in just a second. Something to keep in mind. I'm sure um, many of you flipped on the TV and heard somebody talking about healthcare is the top issue, it's the top issue, as if it was deciding the election. That is not exactly right. There is more, more to say about that. Um, because issues are not the only thing that affects, think about your own vote, people's votes in an election. So when we ask people not what is your top issue, but what's the top factor that influences your vote, of course it was other stuff. It was how they feel about the candidates themselves, and a lot goes into that. It was a referendum on President Trump. Of course this was partly a referendum, even maybe almost all a referendum on President Trump. And it's always party, 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 and whether they are a Democrat or a Republican. So, um, uh, the title of the uh, chart telegraphs the point. Um, you know, top issue does not mean top factor uh, in an election. It did not in this uh, midterm. Uh, this election was no different. It was an election in which turnout was really very high. You should just keep that in mind, higher than any recent election. Uh, some records were set. For example, if you look at, we all talked about the young adults, would they come out and vote? They did really come out to vote. They did not, however, represent a larger um, uh, share uh, of the electorate because everybody came out to vote. Um, so it was about the same share of the electorate overall than uh, they would typically be. Um, I don't know, maybe you could think about it this way. Trump mobilized everyone. Maybe this was the only contribution he's made so far to democracy. <laughs> I don't know. Um, we saw gains for Democrats across all groups, but most notably for those younger voters, as you can see in this chart. And just a few things to watch for as we uh, think about um, 2020. We have um, a divided electorate, divided along partisan lines. And so we think about red states and blue states, but it isn't just red states and blue states. It is divided now, and you may have heard this, and it's empirically true, it's in the data. It's divided also geographically, with Democrats having um, a greater hold on urban areas and some suburban areas, and Republicans in rural areas. So we see this split now in the country and women and Republican women will be a key group um, for health care and the election. Um, I don't know how to say it. I would say the election confirmed the uselessness of men. Um, okay, um, let me take you to the Affordable Care Act. The um, debate, you've experienced this, it may have given you the feeling you know, all kinds of crazy things were happening uh, since 2010. And so 
public opinion must have been jumping all over the place. Actually, that's not what we saw at all. What we've seen is incredible stability in um, opinion since 2010, um, with an uptick in favorability uh, recently as the ACA came under threat and after McCain's historic thumbs down, which I inartfully tried to shove into this chart, it didn't work out um, all that well. Um, but there is more to this story. So the opinion that you see here is not randomly distributed. So what we actually see, and the more important part of the story, that stability conceals, um, I don't even know how to describe it, the sharpest, most disturbing uh, partisan divide that you could imagine. Um, what has happened is our issue doesn't just have a partisan divide, it has become the poster child, the symbol, um, the focal point of the partisan divide in the country. And you can note in this that the favorability tick up for the ACA is entirely among um, Democrats. And, you know, if, if there is a, a lesson from this, a broad one, it, it just points out that while there may have been, there was no choice, really, there just are some real limits to passing any kind of national health reform legislation that has no uh, bipartisan support. And so, a little more on this partisan divide, because it is so profoundly uh, important. We see it um, in a million ways. Uh, we see it um, in the country and on the ACA, on every question we ask. Here we see it on the general question of whether the ACA has helped you and your family. Um, and, you know, you can see uh, here that many people say that correctly that they're not affected by the ACA. But a big chunk of Democrats say they've been helped and Republicans just the opposite um, answer. But what is more interesting to me is even when we survey marketplace enrollees about their actual experiences, we discover there are partisan experiences for the same people with the, in the same uh, income uh, ranges. So for example, you see here 75% of Democrats in the marketplaces say they benefited and 57% of Republicans say they've been hurt. These are the same people in the marketplaces um, Democrats in the marketplaces like their tax credits. Republicans in the marketplaces don't like their tax credits. They're the same people. This is not explained. We ran the regressions by um, any other factor. And I could show you a million charts on this, but I want to show you the one that has the biggest um, impact on me. We became interested at one point in this debate in the views of physicians uh, on the ACA. And were they different? because they're evidence-based, right? Um, so we did this survey of primary care physicians. We actually did this one with the Commonwealth Fund. It's a little bit old, but uh, the point is still as relevant as it ever was. So we looked at physicians. And you can read the chart as well as I was. There was only one factor that explained the differences in the views of physicians on the ACA, and it was whether they were a Democrat um, or a Republican. On the issue of information, it really matters. Um, and we find that levels of um, information are a real issue when it comes to opinion on the ACA, but on everything we look at uh, in health. Uh, here's one example of this. <coughs> Just 41% of the American people know about the one and arguable major achievement that the ACA has had, which is to lower the rate of the uninsured in the country. And I think more strikingly, 31% of the American people have it backwards. They think that it's increased, and he doesn't like this, increased the number of uh, uninsured in the country. And we often find, I won't show you the data, a relationship between lower, higher information or accuracy or knowledge and the ACA. We'll come back to it. I just, on the previous slide, yeah. I have that. I don't recall what it was. Um, we also have separate information on surgeons, which is not pretty. Um, um, 
and so this is the one that really disturbs me the most um, to drive home this point about information. You remember the death panels? This, um, this is an older chart, but we still see it today. This myth persists. I, I, it's still 41% of the American people, it's 42% of seniors believe there are death panels in the ACA. Of course, there are no death panels in the ACA. There are reasons for this. I have a longer uh, talk about the media failure that led to this, how the, despite the fact-checking efforts, the agenda of the media was hijacked by the death panel um, claims, but this is not the place for it. All of this, just to finish this part of the talk, is unfortunately baked into our political system. So this is not our chart. This is from the Cook Political Report. I really respect um, Charlie Cook and the analysis that they do. Um, and it shows the decline in the number of swing districts or contested districts um, in the Congress. But what it means is that our representatives don't really represent the public any longer. I'm sure you know this. But it matters. They represent slivers of the electorate that hold these left-right views or these partisan views that I'm showing you today. And Charlie Cook came up with something else that I can't vouch for, but I thought was interesting and I'd show it to you. So you're thinking, yes, and it's, it's redistricting and it's gerrymandering. And that's what it is. And it is partly that. But their analysis, the Cook analysis, also suggests that we are now sorting ourselves just geographically based on our partisan or political views. So Andy Bynman wants to live near Claire, so that's where he lives. And um, I don't know if they actually live near each other. But um, that, I thought, was an interesting finding. Through all this, and despite all this, slowly, all of this, the sharp partisan views, the lack of information, um, all of it, slowly over time, the ACA has persevered. It's even been winning, despite all these obstacles. That's kind of an amazing thing. Its core elements are absolutely intact. The marketplaces, the subsidies, the Medicaid expansion, those are the core elements of the ACA. It is because the public so highly values and has come to appreciate and understand many of the key benefits and provisions of the ACA. So in the midterms, the galvanizing issue was protections for people with pre-existing conditions. What I wanted to show you is that's not even the most popular provision. It's not even close to the most popular provision. So there are many others which are slightly, uh, more than slightly uh, popular, more popular, including the provision that young adults stay on their parents' um, policies. And I wrote about this. Uh, you can check it out. I, I write a regular column in Axios um, if you want to check it out, but you may not want to. Which brings me to Medicare for All, which I'm imagining you might have more than a casual interest in. There is, more, there is a new energy in the country uh, and on the left behind Medicare for All and a variety of related proposals. Um, and that's reflected also in the general opinion that we see. So we see it ticking up, you know, over a long period of time, uh, using different language in our questions because it's been called different things over this um, period of time. And yes, what you call it really matters. I thought you might be interested in this. So um, Medicare for All is the most popular name. Um, universal health coverage is popular, and you can see what's at the bottom, and that's no surprise uh, in our country. Uh, there's actually very little Medicare or no Medicare in, Me in Bernie Sanders' Medicare for All, but Bernie Sanders knows this, so it's no accident that his plan is called Medicare for All. And again, we are divided along partisan lines uh, on this, just as we are everything in health. And you can see this looks at strong support and strong um, opposition. What I think is important to understand about Medicare for All is where we are in the debate. We're at a point in the debate when this is about a rallying cry, an idea, a very powerful idea, as I just showed you. We put out a new poll today. This is not the new poll, but it's the same set of findings. 
it is an idea that is malleable and that is moved by the arguments that would be made if we had an actual debate about Medicare for all or related legislation. So you can see um, in this uh, first slide about this, what happens to opinion when many of the arguments that are made on behalf of Medicare for all are made that it would reduce administrative costs or establish health care as a right. It goes up into the 70s. So it really does move. But you can see in this next slide um, what happens when some of the arguments are made that would be made against a Medicare for all type plan. Opposition goes up into the 60s just that it would give government more control or that it would raise taxes. Of course, the critics wouldn't bother to say that that is offset by the elimination of employer premiums um, uh, or other arguments that would be made. And it matters because today we're at one stage in a discussion of Medicare for All. In the future, we may be at a different stage. There are also some big misconceptions still, information, deficits about Medicare for All. So just look at the right side of the pie here, and you can see the big percentage of the American people. Um, in the uh, new poll we put out today, it's over 50% who have private coverage who don't know that in a Bernie Sanders-style Medicare for All plan, they would no longer have their private coverage. So that's an issue, and it's just something to think about. And this leads to all the different plans about Medicare for All. Um, and what we find when we look at them basically is that they're all popular. That's the first thing to say. The most popular are the more incremental and least threatening plans. And you see that over uh, at, the right, at the right side. Now the political energy is not with the least threatening and more incremental plans, but they are the most popular with the general public. So that is something to keep in mind. I want to say a few things about the Medicaid program. We do a ton of work at Kaiser on the Medicaid program. In the policy and political and provider world, this has always been the program historically that someone, everyone has found some reason to be frustrated with or to hate. Um, you know, conservatives don't like it because it's the Pac-Man entitlement or whatever words they choose. Liberals, because there are these inequities between states. It doesn't go far enough. Uh, providers, because the rates are too low. What has happened is that um, while almost uh, no one has noticed, Medicaid has become almost as popular with the American people as the so-called sacrosanct or sacred programs, Medicare and even Social Security. And the reason for that is the finding that I stuck the uh, arrow next to. It now covers almost 75 million people and reaches such a broad cross-section of the American people. So they have a favorable view of the program. Um, they think it's important. They don't want the program cut in non-expansion states. They want it expanded. It's a totally different program with a totally different public view of the program um, than it was 10 or even 20 years ago. Lurking behind the debate about Medicaid today is a fundamental issue that doesn't get debated much, but it's there and it's behind the debate about work requirements, the caps, the cuts, everything. And it is uh, whether we view Medicaid as some form of a welfare program, another form of cash assistance, um, or as an insurance program for low-income people. And no surprise, you can see again the difference between Democrats and Republicans, but it's really conservative Republicans um, on this issue. And that matters because if you view it as insurance, you're likely to want to protect it or even expand it. And in our country, sadly, if you view it as some form of welfare, you're more likely to want to cut it or impose work requirements on people in order to get it. Did you ever hear of anyone at proposing work requirements for your Aetna or Blue Cross coverage? Um, but because of the ways in which, didn't move, there we go, um, the program is now viewed. The public is really clear about where they stand on these big debates about the future of the program, whether it should be capped, whether it should become a block grant program, or whether it should be kept as it is. They like it the way it is. They are nervous 
about capping, cutting, and block granting the program. Um, there is now talk of something new, block grant waivers. We can get into that in the Q&A if, if you want. But that's a modest idea, nothing like the sweeping block grant proposals we heard. And this is the issue I want to close with and the issue that is closest to, to my heart. So while the focus has been on the a ACA, just beneath the radar while we've all been having that hot debate, there has been, I think, a quiet revolution in what health insurance is in the country from broader coverage to skimpier, less comprehensive coverage. And that has given rise to the most important thing for me I want to talk to you about today. Um, and I call it healthcare as a pocketbook issue. And I have come, become deeply concerned about a set of things that I will now show you. Uh, it starts with large percentages of the American people who are just struggling with their health care bills. Look just over at the right side of the chart. And you see there the large percentages of people struggling with their deductibles. As insurance has become less comprehensive and deductibles go up every year a little more, every year a little more. This is not perception. This is not just in their heads. We do the big benchmark survey every year of what's happening in, in group coverage and private coverage and employer coverage. And this is what's happening. So you can see here in the yellow line how deductibles have been rising. And you can see the gap, the comparison between the yellow line and the blue line between the increase in deductibles and people's wages. That gap is the pain level for people. Within 2018, deductibles rising four times faster than wages, but in many years, five times and sometimes six times faster than wages. So that's why people are feeling the pain. And we see this as a result. I'll come back to the unexpected medical bills in a second, but what we see is people more concerned, more worried, having bigger problems with their health care bills of different kinds than stuff you would think people worry about a lot more than health care in their daily lives. Their gas and transportation costs, their utility bills, paying for the rent or the mortgage, paying for food. And remember, most Americans are week to week, don't have much money in savings. So it has become a big concern. Just for a sec, let me go back to this issue of unexpected medical bills, which wasn't the top of the list and that surprised me to see it at the top of the list. But what I keep experiencing is when we do, and I do, focus groups with voters and other people, and you ask them, what are you most worried about? Your deductible, your premium, your drug costs? Expected them to say drug costs, right? What we most hear about, and no expert would ever cite as the top problem, are their surprise medical bills. Um, Again, because most people live paycheck to paycheck, and I think because they think it's just so unfair and it is so wrong. They are not all for out-of-network care, as you can see in this sl slide. Some of them are. Some are just, they tried to understand their insurance. They thought they understood it. They didn't, and there was a surprise. What is most worrisome are the consequences of this. We've done this question many times ourselves with the New York Times. And so the consequences of this, this is what really motivates voters, what concerns voters when I talk to them about health care. The ways in which these health care bills ripple through their families and their family budgets. So you can see the extraordinary percentage of people who say they had to do things like cut spending on household items, use up most of their savings, take another job or yet another job. Um, borrow money from friends and family. These are really quite serious consequences that us healthcare people, what do we focus on? People delay care, they cut pills, they skip care. We don't focus on this very much, but this is what we hear about. And then the issue, which for me is the really big issue, it's sick people who we see are really struggling the most with these bills for all of these things. Now, not surprising in one sense, sick people use the most care, but not the way a healthcare system should um, really work. Look at those numbers, 52% of people who are sick struggling with their medical bills. We have tried to popularize this 
uh, at Kaiser Health News in a variety of ways. Um, we have a great feature called Bill of the Month, which we do with NPR and CBS News. You can check it out while I'm on the subject. Um, if you just want to be updated on all this health policy stuff, we have a really great podcast that our senior Washington correspondent, Julie Robner, does um, called What the Health. Um, and Julie does it only with women health policy journalists. And Julie's line is, yeah, if a man ever showed up who was any good, we'd have a man too. <laughs> um, so um, why don't we talk about these issues more than we do? Um, I'm not sure. Uh, I have a kind of a thought about this, which I'm also not sure about, but I'll just share it with you and then close. Um, I call it the disconnect. I'm not sure that's the right word for it, but it is that our field or our fields are a set of uh, overlapping agendas and conversations that don't connect very much about all of these things. And so I made up two, if I even remember what a Venn diagram is, Venn diagrams to just describe this to you. We have these different conversations where um, the policymakers and the politicians, the world we operate in most have been entirely focused on the ACA uh, and related issues, a little bit Medicaid, and now this Texas case. The media follows suit. That's where the heat is. That's where the politics is. Um, many of us in the healthcare and research communities have been focused on something else, this concept of value for the healthcare dollar and reforming the delivery system. I'm not being critical of it. I'm just describing. Oh, I did have a guy in a focus group once when I asked him about the idea of value. He literally said to me, if I want value, I'll go to Olive Garden. For my health care, I'm going to the Mayo Clinic. <laughs> <laughs> and then the point of the slide, the public is focused on these issues. And I not only am not critical of the public for this, but as I tried to describe, uh, families are really struggling with this, and I think it's a very serious issue. Well, here's my one other Venn diagram way of um, uh, thinking about this. It's just that we have many different health cost problems. And so when I talk to employers, they're mostly trying to drive down the annual increase in their premium. When you talk to people in Washington, they're mostly, and some experts, economists, focused on, you know, that percentage of GDP. Uh, 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 in D.C., the deficit hawks are focused on Medicare and Medicaid's share of federal spending. Uh, we've talked about value, and now I'm going on. What is the public focused on? But here's my version of that. So let me close this off with, with uh, some take-home points. First, um, the pulse of the public on health policy is a sharply divided public along partisan lines. They didn't make this up in Congress. It is in Congress. But it's actually broader than that, uh, and it's more real. And our issue has become a proxy uh, for the broader partisan divide uh, in the country. I think we have to find a way out of this somehow. I don't know the way out of this, because um, it didn't work out very well to pass a major health reform uh, law without any uh, bipartisan support. And assuming this is an audience mostly of Democrats and um, Progressives, it will not work out well if we imagine um, Democrats capturing everything in 2020 uh, and passing something else without bipartisan support. And should that something be some variation on Medicare for All or an expansion of public programs, we will see an even sharper divide than we have seen so far. Second, as I've been saying, um, we are not talking enough about what to me emerges in the data it's the number one problem in healthcare now. The problems Americans who are sick are having uh, paying their healthcare bills and the toll that is taking on their lives, especially at a time when wage growth is relatively flat. This is the opposite of how a functional and compassionate healthcare system should work. It should take care of the sickest among us. Most of all, not least of all, I believe there is a medical bills crisis in the, in the country. Um, that we're not paying enough attention to. And finally, and this may be the um, biggest point of all as a presidential campaign kicks off, policymakers and candidates are not connecting their plans 
and ideas to the problems in a way people can understand to the problems people are struggling with every day, their deductibles, their premiums, their drug costs, those surprise bills that I told you about. And I think that the candidate who finds a way to do that will have discovered the secret sauce, both for the Trump voter in Indiana, but also the lifelong Democrat in Oakland. And so what jumps out at me from all the data is that what's missing in health, in a word, is a real consumer agenda in health that frames our issue as a pocketbook issue. Um, I just have one last big caveat, which is that I'm just constitutionally suspicious of people who are certain about anything. So I'm not all that certain about any of these conclusions. Um, they are what I think I see in the polling, what I think I hear in the focus groups, and what, um, and they are mistakes I think I see candidates making having watched countless candidates develop 15 or 20 or 30 point plans, you know the one I'm thinking of, that go right by uh, the American people, even though those plans would help the American people with all the problems that they're concerned about. So, um, not certain about it, but it's what I think I see in the data. And so, the only thing I will say to you with certainty today is, we're actually really thrilled now to be your neighbors, and to the extent I've got it wrong, I'm uh, I am certain that these new UCSF Kaiser Fellows will come over for a year and, and set me right. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Drew. And I think we have a few minutes for questions, so um, we open that up for a couple questions. Here in the nation state of California, we have the possibility, not just necessarily in the next four years, over the next year, eight years, to serve as an island of experimentation, okay? And, but the question is whether we've, what are the things we really don't know that we think we know, mm -hmm. okay? And, and how do we get to where we need to go? Because I believe the Newsom administration is selecting a group of very smart people to address the problem. But where can we really fail? Yeah. You know, we've got, We've got the red states and the blue states moving in very different directions, but California is unique. And the agenda that the governor has announced is an incredibly important and ambitious agenda, whether it's covering undocumented people up to 26 or the mandate or the subsidies for somewhat higher income people or this idea I don't think we quite grasp yet of bulk purchasing for drugs and some other ideas. So certainly we as an organization we haven't done this, we've been national and global, we haven't done that much in California. We, we really need to get on this as an organization. And uh, one, try and figure out what all that means and how it, how it can work. Uh, but two, I think all the other states, and particularly the blue states, but not just the blue states, will be watching that very closely. Also the models of delivery and how, how you make that work at, you know, on the ground not just covering the people, but actually delivering the services. Uh, if, if a Democratic candidate, one of the 20 or so, came and asked you for advice, uh, A, would you advise them to push Medicare for all? And B, what would you advise them to, how would you advise them to parry the two or three most logical ways that it's going to get, uh, the pushback will come and it will get demagogued? Well, we don't do that, and I don't do that, but I would lay out for them the pros and the cons and the pitfalls of the various approaches, not just the opinion, but analytically, you know, the numbers, the costs, the number of people who would be served, and we would do that for Democrats, and we would do that for Republicans. I don't mean to duck your question, but um, we, we just don't do that. It's not, not something that we do. To what extent do your focus groups and polling overlap with voter opinion? Mm -hmm. That's the first question. And the second is, we have this new officer in California named the Attorney General. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, the, the Surgeon General. The Surgeon General. And I was wondering if you could comment on what you think that position could mean and accomplish, and in particular, given the... Dr. Burke just being appointed. Um, how do you see her influencing policy in the state? 
Um, well, first, on question number one, uh, as we get closer to elections, it becomes critically important in our polls to focus on voters and likely voters. We also need to focus on the public and subgroups that we're trying to give a voice in our polls. So that's one objective. But the elected officials, as you get closer to elections, they really just want to know about voters. Uh, so we have to do both, and we do both. <laughs> On your second question, um, not sure I know. Um, there are other states that have surgeons generals, and obviously this is a position from which one can advocate for issues which are neglected. We don't pay enough attention to issues like mental health services uh, in the state of California, where you can take on issues where problems like stigma are such an impediment to effectively addressing the issue, uh, not just mental health, but for example, the opioid epidemic. I mean, a big part of that challenge, I believe, is stigma at all levels. Um, and so those are areas in particular where a Surgeon General, I think, can play a big role. I would like to see a Surgeon General armed with data and analysis, too, not just a soapbox. So if you think back to effective surgeons general in the history of our country, whether you go way back to you know, Julie Richmond or just to David Satcher, uh, who was a member of our board and a great, I thought a great surgeon general, when David issued his different reports on controversial issues, those, are, those were reports. Uh, which provided a vehicle for him to speak out and speak to the legislature and speak to um, uh, policymakers and, and others uh, on an issue, whether the issue was, and sometimes really controversial issues like sexual health, that maybe nobody really wanted him to have a report on, but he did. And so I would like to see the Surgeon General armed with the resources it doesn't necessarily mean they have to have a big staff, but the resources to produce uh, powerful reports with evidence from which they speak. The thing that I really wanted to, wanted to ask is if you could just continue on from your last bullet point, where you said that there is a consumer agenda mm -hmm. that would be a thing to focus on. Mm -hmm. Could you just give some kind of outline of what that agenda would be and somehow differentiating from the 10 or 20 points that would actually constitute the policy implications yeah, of that I, agenda? I, I think the heart of it is it doesn't focus on policy ideas and policy proposals. It focuses on what, what actually can be done. And it isn't all by government about uh, the things people worry about most, which are their premiums, their deductibles, their drug costs, uh, their surprise medical bills, and the fact that they can't make any sense of the system and how it works, uh, their hospital bills, uh, just making uh, that make sense for them. Uh, and with a special focus on real people and not the high information consumers for whom there might be an app. There's somebody in my office every week with a product that I'm sure has a market, but um, it is not the solution for the, you know, majority of, of, of Americans um, who uh, may not even understand the difference between a premium and a deductible, our research shows. So it, uh, uh, they, there are other countries which forgive uh, uh, cost-sharing for very sick people. There are a few employers in our country um, who have different levels of cost sharing depending upon the wage levels of employers. Actually, universities more typically do it than employers. Uh, so it isn't just what the Congress can do, but throughout the system, a, a more consumer, uh, uh, a consumer agenda that focuses on the problems as people really experience them which are just about how it's really these bills and how they are affecting their lives and their families, which, by the way, also affects their health. When you're taking a second job and a third job and you're borrowing money from your family and your friends and you, you know, can't pay for food because of your medical bills, that affects your health as much as it affects your economic security. So I want to have people join us in thanking Dr. Altman for this wonderful talk. Thank you.